Welcome everybody to the War Room. This is the pre-game show for the June OCC Clash. We have our top eight. They will be competing for 500 US dollars as well as a maximum of 25 points in an attempt to qualify for the Officer Club Championship Ultimate coming to you in uh, just under two months at this point. So we are absolutely getting there. I am your host, Christo. I am joined by our expert panel of Darkness Bubbles and Birdo, who will be breaking down some of the decks for you here today on the pre-show. We're going to be joined during the main cast by Spooz and the debut of Miss Starry Van. So uh, stay tuned for that. We also have four cards for you, four new reveals for the Brothers in Arms expansion. That's coming to you June 27th. So stay tuned. We have a bunch of action and uh, bubbles. I think it was you who uh, was looking at the deck lists and said, oh, it's the last one before the expansion. People are bringing all sorts of shenanigans. So yeah, uh, I mean, there's, there's some crazy stuff in there. We've got OTK decks. We've got sort of unit list decks. We've got all sorts of crazy stuff. And you might think, oh, you're just sort of speculating that this is a, a little bit more fun. But I actually, I reached out to quite a few of the players and asked them, and and most of the multiple players were like, I don't know, it just looked fun. I just felt like doing it. So there, there's certainly an element of this is the last one. Let's roll the dice a little bit. Let's try and put on a little bit of a show before this new meta comes out. We've got a lot of new cards coming out in the expansion. And obviously the cards being rotated out in the reserve list as well. So it's a sort of last huzzah for this sort of era of cards before we move on to this next step for cards where it's it's taking new steps and how it's going to sort of morph and, and sculpt its competitive scene. Bubbles is absolutely our in-the-field reporter gathering all the news and dirt on what people are bringing and why. Speaking of those people, why don't we bring up the bracket here and walk through exactly who we're going to see competing in the OCC Clash for June. There you have it. We're going to start at the top of the bracket. This is going to be one of our featured quarterfinal matchups. We're going to have J King taking on Ying. The second matchup, we're going to have No in 5 going up against Azzy. We've got Tang Tang taking on Bezio. And Ziyang going up against Top Chef. I think that is the first time I am seeing Top Chef, and I absolutely adore the name, so I'm excited for that. Um, we're going to break down all of the player cards. You can get to know your players just a little bit better during the main broadcast, so stay tuned for that. We're coming to you in, uh, in less than 30 minutes at this point. But let's get down and dirty. Let's start taking a look at the decks. And, uh, Berto, why don't we start with you? You had wanted to walk through Azzy's lineup, so let's uh, let's dive into it. Let's have Mark Theus bring that up on the screen here so you can take a look at what they're bringing today. I sure did. So uh, the first deck we see here is a full unitless deck. Um, this deck is not running a single unit, even though it did become popular at one point to run cards like the M18 Hellcat, uh, which have Blitz and are able to immediately trade out. Uh, and the point of this deck is if you don't run any units, uh, your opponent doesn't have any useful, all that removal in their hand. So even if you are using a little bit less efficient removal, like cards such as United We Stand, you're still able to come ahead on value because there's so many dead cards in your opponent's deck. Uh, so I'm really excited to see this, and I'm interested in the choice to run no units at all. We'll see how that works out. Uh, next up, we have a crazy thing to see here. Uh, we have Japan US uh, Tony OTK um, with three copies of Haiyan and two copies of the Kia Key 61 Tony. Uh, so this deck aims to ramp up in the early game and get down either a Tony or a Hian, use a burst of fire and use a bolster the ranks to just explode your opponent's HQ for a ton of damage. But of course, the issue is getting to that point. The issue is getting through guards of the control decks and surviving against the aggro decks. You do have a few options against guard, like the one copy of patrol and even a copy of isolation, which can, as a bonus, uh, be used on something like a Hian for to keep it safe for a little bit of extra damage in the late game. Potentially, we even have a single copy of Empire of the Sun for removal and draw, which is crazy to see. 
Uh, and then lastly, we have a Britain Germany discard deck um, with uh, a huge variety of cards in it. We have a single copy of Fog of War, really effective against things like Brit Air. You're able to use it on Swordfish or Gladiators and really slow somebody down, especially if they've already buffed up those units. Um, we have things like Churchill, even Lancaster B3 for huge late game uh, power cards, uh, but only a single copy of Fortification. So we'll see if he's able to survive that long. Yeah, so a incredible lineup with lots of exciting things going on here from Azzy. What kind of world do we live in where the discard deck is the closest thing to a normal um, meta deck that we're seeing that Ozzy is bringing? I do have a question about the unit list deck, um, Birdo. You walked through the reason behind the deck being unitless, and I get that. Um, how do you win without units? <laughs> usually fatigue. Uh, usually you just let your opponent run out of cards. Sometimes you can use Phony War to expedite that process for your opponent a little bit. Um, it, yeah, if your opponent runs out of threats and you have a few more cards in your deck or a little more healing, then you are able to just wait it out and they won't be able to deal any damage to you. So I'm going to go start um, another pot of coffee between the pre-show <laughs> and the main broadcast if Azzy goes far today. Um, Bubbles, did you get any insight into uh, Azzy's lineup? I know you were doing some digging. Any uh, any thoughts or information? Yeah, so I was expecting this unit list to be like, well, it's good against this deck. It's good against maybe Japan or Frontline. And I, I built it because of this, and I'm really worried about this. Um, but when Azzy was questioned about why did you bring this deck, his words were, it's good against No and Five. That's it. That's all he wanted to say is just, it's good against No and Five. Uh, and, you know, you've got to respect that where someone's like, I don't really care if it beats anyone else. I just want to beat my round one. That's, that's my strategy here. Go in, win round one, get out. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll be interesting to see if it pays off. And if No and Five just is like, that's good against me. I'm banning it. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, right on. While, while we're with you, uh, you wanted to walk through J King's lineup. So why don't we, uh, why don't we take a peek? Yeah. So J King's got an interesting lineup here. Now, obviously a bit of a newcomer to cards. We've not really seen J King before. <laughs> so he's bringing in some slightly weird decks because of that, but we've got this Japan fame deck. This is going to be, I think, the last tournament where we see this, we we may see a little bit of it in like the open qualifiers and stuff still <clears throat> before it gets rotated out, but Feigned Retreat is on the way out in rotation. So this is the last time we're going to be seeing this deck in the OCCs. It's a, a goodbye to this much beloved and also much hated by its opponent's deck. Um, we've seen Jake and done a few sort of evolutions in it, recently finding a way to put in this Panzer Free H. This helps draw for your deck a little bit. And obviously Jake King stuck on two order feigned. There was always a bit of a debate between two order and three order feigned and Jake King went with two order. I'm just excited to see this deck one last time. I hope maybe one day we get some sort of legacy tournaments where this deck can come back to shine again. But for now, this is the last time we're going to see this deck. So I hope we get to see it pop off and have some success today. The next list is a, well, it's a, it's a Soviet OTK deck. It's Siberian OTK. Another deck which is on its way out. And that's a trend with Jaking's decks today. We see him playing with decks which are sort of very popular and are not going to be playable at least in the same style they were before now this deck it plans to slow down the game as much as possible to a halt you know you've got things like mud in here this is just going to stop the board pushing you've got lots of guards lots of ways of just preventing your opponent from doing things and then you attempt to reduce your your final pushes with stuff like observer core and go for this big kill by dropping a Siberian, OT, uh, Siberian transfer. You get a 5-5 tank. You play Ura. You play a bunch of final pushes. And you just smash through your opponent's board for lethal. So this is good against things like Frontline or Soviet Control. Against Soviet Control, you use your Great Patriotic War to negate their healing. And, and just these sort of slower-paced or ground-based decks. It's weaker against things like Brit Air because, again, these, these air units, they can just ignore your guard with the bombers and Mud is a dead card in this matchup and it's often too quick. And even if you do find your combo pieces, it can be difficult to actually get the credits to do so without a unit to attack in the front line. Um, it's also weak against Discard because you sort of 
don't have many ways of counteracting their discard and your opponent can potentially just high roll lethal on you as well as play you know, like a black watch and brick your hand um and then the third and final deck this is a old classic this is soviet germany control now this deck will most likely live on after the expansion and after the rotation um, because it is getting support through other cards but one of the key pieces of the deck is manostrum and this is getting rotated out and this, what this does is it gives a unit plus one plus one and whenever this unit attacks in combat you gain health equal to the damage of doubt and this is sort of defined this deck for a long time this has been one of your your main ways of, of beating aggressive decks obviously you've got careless talk and sudden strikes still of their rush but you can heal so much so quickly and the sort of gg for this deck is dropping say a leopold or something like this and putting you know an ostrom on it and then just beating down your opponent in a matter of two or three turns as well as having comet which is a really powerful late game tool i do think this deck will survive rotation and it will survive the expansion but it may drop down to sort of tier three instead of tier two um, but i i do think it has the anti-aggressive tools to be able to survive even without my ostrom so we see j king bringing Three decks where we might not see them as much, if at all, in the future, and, and a sort of last hurrah for, for this style of cards before rotation comes in. Awesome. Thank you, Bubble. So, J King, uh, giving a, a fond farewell to some of our favorites. I do believe you said uh, Soviet Germany control. I think you meant German Italy control. But, you know, we, we saw it on the screen. We figured it out. Mary Nostrum kind of gives it away. I was just, so, just testing you, making sure you were paying attention. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the Jagro feigned aspect of, you know, feigned going away and that kind of making the deck a little bit weaker. I feel like Jagro will live on, might be in a different kind of state, but there's always going to be space for that aggressive kind of almost budget deck for a lot of newer players as well. Am I right? And yeah, I can't see Jagro as a concept going away. It was a thing before Fade Retreat, and it'll be a thing after. It will just have to adapt and evolve. I know myself and a couple other players are betting that it's actually going to be a Japan Soviet destruction style deck with Matsu Sumamoto, this card which essentially gives you free signal regiments, which can be really powerful. And then because you've got Soviet ally for the destruction cards like Chaika, you could now supplement in five year plan as your new draw engine. I think the thing which defines which version of Jaguar is going to be playable is which version gets the most consistent draw engines. It's possible. We'll just see Feind Retreat stick about and Feind Retreat gets replaced with Enigma. And that's just all there is to it. it. It really depends on the meta. It depends if there's control decks for you to use Enigma against. And, and I think the key factor in how Jaguar evolves as a deck is going to be what offers them the most consistent draw to stay in the game. Because that's why Feind Retreat is so popular at the moment. Thanks for breaking that down, Bubbles. Let's move on. Darkness, you're going to talk about Noen's list now. Um, Bubbles had specifically said Ozzy prepared specifically for Noen. Uh, so why don't you walk us through what Noen is bringing here and uh, what their chances are against Ozzy in the first round. Yeah, looking at Noen's deck here, the first thing to mention is he's bringing Brit Air. Um, of course, this is considered the current meta deck, the current strongest deck. It's Brit Japan, very fast, very aggressive. You play a bunch of low cost fighter like the Gladiator or the Swordfish, and you are using close air support to to buff those units and to to make them more more sticky to the uh, just more stable by the 1-1 one, one buff divided by two or three units. And with those, you're able to build up a lot of pressure towards the enemy HQ because fighters can attack directly into it and the bombers even can trade without losing your own units. So this deck is very powerful. Uh, the second deck, 9-5, is bringing is kind of his signature deck. So this is... Uh, very interesting to look at not most people do not find a lot of success with it it's soviet us ramp control you're using the powerful guards and value cards of the soviet union like uh, first rifles for example and like partisans or 272nd guards and you are even faster to reach those 
a little bit expensive units with the War Machine as a cheap RAM card from the US Ally. And of course, the US Ally is very powerful, for example, with the B-17 Flying Fortress. Uh, so, and, and the Fifth Rangers, of course, mobilization, just adding a lot of value to the already valued deck. And the third is also this OTK Tony deck uh, Berto Burrito talked about and as he is playing this. So I'm I'm not really sure why both of players are bringing the same deck when as he is saying this deck is good against no one five. I think um, he's referring to the signature deck in this case, the Soviet Union deck, because the Soviet Union deck is very, very slow. And it's difficult to to get to this point to uh, find the OTK to be able to yeah not die, survive, break through all of the guards and make this combo work. So I think... As he was referring to this deck is good or can be strong against Soviet ramp because it gives you a lot of time to get to that dangerous OTK point. But on the other side, we will maybe see just a mirror match and uh, there the odds should be relatively even. There are a few minor differences. For example, 9-5 um, is playing the... Osaka regiment and I think Azi is not but uh, yeah in the end it's just just a mirror match and I don't think uh, this deck is very worried uh, uh, his first deck the Brit Air is very worried about this deck because it uh, can snowball much faster so in this in this scenario, then you've got the opportunity for that mirror matchup, and OTK mirror matchups can be exciting because everybody's trying to grab their first piece their, or their last piece to try and try and pull their combo off. Um, so is it fair to say? And I guess Bubbles, you had the conversation you may know as well that Ozzy was really referring to that unit list deck going into the control kind of Soviet US ramp deck that that no one is playing. So while they said, "Hey, this is good against no one," they meant this is good against one of no one's decks, and I really just want to beat him with that. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's difficult to predict what your opponent's going to bring as well. So unless um, unless they knew No. 5's full matchup, then it's more likely what they meant is it's good against what No. 5 normally brings. Um, I, I do think it's okay against Predair because you have backline hate, so it, it might be quite nice in that as well because No. 5 is known for enjoying Predair. But I think this Soviet USA uh, deck is certainly something that Azzy was hoping to snipe with this unitless deck. So we've seen no one bringing Brit Air. Um, I would say maybe what two, three OCCs ago, we would see six of the eight competitors bring Brit Air. I think the last OCC was like 50 50. Has anybody looked at the rest of the lineup? Do we have more Brit Air going on, or are we slowly seeing that die out for folks bringing fun stuff before the, uh, the expansion flips? I think we are having five times Brit Air. It's still the most popular deck. Um, and J Agro with Faint Retreat. Uh, every second uh, player is bringing Z. So there are four, four copies of Z. And three players are bringing US German Frontline. And the rest of the decks are only uh, being played by one or two players. So this is an incredible mixed and, and diverse um OCC we are about to witness today awesome well I am excited to um you know kind of kind of wrap up this chapter of cards and move into a, a big jump with the new expansion so stay tuned we're gonna have all the action for the June OCC clash coming up in just a few moments
Welcome everybody to the June OCC Clash. We have our top eight competing here for $500 as well as up to 25 cards points that will get them qualified for the OCC Ultimate. I am your host, Christo. I am joined by Spooz and Birdo here. We have got Darkness, we have got Bubbles, and we have Starry waiting in the wings for future matches. Tons of action for you here today. But Spooz, we didn't get a chance to uh, chat during the pre-show like we normally do. I, I miss you, buddy. Yeah. So I, uh, you. I wanted to ask, you know, we, we talked a little bit during the pre-show about how this is sort of uh, kind of an end of an era big changes coming up the reserve pool new expansion coming out any any thoughts about kind of all the changes happening to cards and how this could be like the last event where we see some popular decks like jagro being meta yeah i think I, I have some mixed feelings about it like um we've seen the current meta decks like for almost two years now and i think everybody's really fed up with them we want to see something else we want to see new cards we want to see new decks but yeah, on the other hand, it's also just like, um, yeah, we, we lose some really familiar decks here. We are really, we really know how to play them. The players know how to play them. We as viewers know what to expect out of them, what the win conditions are, which is also a benefit. If you just watch something and you know what are the tactics behind it. So we, I think in the, in the next few weeks, we have to get familiar with new stuff. And that's what I'm looking forward to. But I'm also looking forward to today and just see, yeah, it, it just come, feels like coming home and watching your home sports and just, yeah, you're just very familiar with it and uh, just enjoy watching the decks and the players playing today here, I guess. I was going to say, I finally learned how the decks work and we're going to change it all. Fantastic. Uh, no. <laughs> um, let's, let's bring up the bracket and see who's going to be competing here today. So we're going to show you the, uh, the first feature quarterfinal, which is going to be J King versus Ying. Uh, Birdo and Spooz are going to take us through that one. Uh, Noen and Azzy are going to be our second quarterfinal. Our second feature match, however, is going to be Tang Tang taking on Bezio. We're going to have Bubbles and Starry making their debut here on the the cast so excited for that as well and we've got z young going up against top chef in our final quarter final so um lots going on here as the players vie for an occ ultimate berth why don't we jump in and uh, and take a look at the player cards here for our first matchup we've got uh jay king here first um no surprise finishing first here we've seen jay king in every occ to date playing 408 matches and 82 percent win rate uh, now, Birdo, you and Jay can go way back. Any insight, any fun fact, anything you can share with us that we haven't already talked about having seen Jay King's player card a million times before? Well, I know, I'm I... putting you on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm just looking at 82.6%. Is that a new record? Because usually we see like 80 point something. But that extra 2%, that's really hard to manage. And I know from experience, uh, <laughs> pushing that extra tiny bit, that extra 1%, 2% is an absolute mountain to climb. And, well, J. King has climbed it. Hey, you, you might be right. And I, I, I was going to say we can check with the cards historians, but uh, J. King is probably one of the first and foremost cards historians. But we've seen in the 80s for sure. But to your point, Berto, we may not have seen 82 before. So we'll have to go back and, uh, and check the archives on that one. It's an excellent question. Let's... Uh, so uh, Mark Theus is telling us that apparently no one may have crossed the 83% threshold at one point, but that is just hearsay right now. Just hearsay. Oh. We'll, we'll get back to you if we get more details. Um, let's bring up, yeah, let's take a look at Ying here. Um, finishing 35th, so Ying did make it through the qualifier. 68% uh, win rate with 424 total matches. Um, Spooze, any insight on Ying? I mean, it's it's just very impressive that he has almost the same matches played as Jay King, and yeah, looking at sixty eight percent win rate, which is still very impressive. It just feels like it's it just worlds between Jay King's mm -hmm. last season and and Ying's um, last season. But he made it to the qualifiers, and I think that that's really a good um, thing to to get rolling, to just get into the tournament vibe, know that you can do it. That just gives you the momentum. And yeah, it's it's really impressive. I'm, the only thing I'm really sad about it that his favorite card is Commonwealth, and he's not playing a Commonwealth deck today. But I think in the current meta, Commonwealth is is not really in a in a good spot in a tournament scene. 
Hey, we I believe we did see it in the last OCC, though. I don't remember how it performed, but we did see the card. Actually, no, I think the, the card won a game even, did it not? Don't Maybe ask I'm... me. I'm above, I'm above 40, so I can't even remember what I ate for dinner <laughs> yesterday. So. Don't Fair ask enough, me about Spooze. what happened last OCC. <laughs> Fair enough, Spooze. I'm sorry I brought that up. While we're talking about decks, let's go ahead and dive in and, and take a look at what the players are bringing here today. Um, so we got Ying's lineup first. Spooze, why don't you uh, you go ahead and break down what Ying's got for us here today? Yeah, while a lot of players today are just yeah having at least one deck that is not really popular at the moment, Ying, one of the players that is having a very, very standard lineup here today. So he just wants to show in his first appearance in an OECC how well he can perform. So it's just logical that he's bringing the three best decks that are currently in the game, starting with us germany frontline deck that we've just seen a billion times um up to this point a deck that is very very dominant currently and just has the goal to go to the front line establish the front line and then just yeah follow up with germans we can do it to buff your units and yeah just overwhelm your opponent by just pure pure force of units stick um with two blitzkrieg here in that deck that can be a very very good finisher but on the other hand as we've seen sometimes if you're just stuck with a hand with two blitzkrieg and not too much else it can also um fire back a little bit then we just have that japan german aggro deck with the faint retreat in it bubble just mentioned it might be the last appearance of faint retreat jaguar in this um occ here today and then we have the one of the best decks when not the best deck in the game currently britain japan air um, Ying playing with two Aichis, some players just don't play it, but I think it's a very, very good choice to put Aichi in the deck. Sure, it has two operation costs, but it's so sticky on the board, because even if your opponent can remove it, you just get another Aichi, which is even more damage. So you have to take care of two bombers in one turn, otherwise it's not really worth to spend any, any stuff on it, because, yeah, it's just still something on the board for your opponent if you don't kill two bombers and overall yeah just the very aggressive deck you want to have your one cray uh, 1k air units on the board early on buff them with the close air support and then just be very aggressive but even if you cannot manage to find good early game this this deck has just so much tools with for example you can just play hms illustrious into empire strikes for board clear gives you the board control back and then you have stuff like the close air support to buff them. You, even late in the game or, or mid in the game, you can just come back with this deck. So even if you find not your aggression, aggression early on, you can still find your back uh, your your way back into the match. Thanks for running us through that, Spooze. Like you mentioned, kind of a standard template for what we've seen a lot of in the last uh, few months of the OCC. Let's bring up J-King's lineup while we're at it. And Berto, you can walk us through a bit of this. We did have Bubbles kind of talk through uh, some of the finer points in the pre-show. So you can maybe take a little bit of a higher level approach. But I am curious because... We've got Ying bringing some of the best cards in the tournament scene or the best lineups in the tournament scene. And J-King's bringing some less traditional decks i'm wondering as to your insight into how j king's going to be able to deal with the fire that ying's bringing here well that's an interesting question of course you have jagro which can beat any deck in the game really um just because when you're playing so fast and so aggressively even decks that are good into jagro are sometimes not able to find their tools and the decks that um Ying uh, is bringing aren't even particularly good into Jagro. Air is probably the best uh, matchup, but even then, it's probably not much over a 50% win rate. Um, and then with the Siberian transfer OTK, um, these low health units in both US mid range and in Jagro become a little bit of a liability. Uh, because once they move up to the front line and they get um, Scorched Earthed, then that's a one health unit that you're able to use Ura on your your units to uh, trade into and deal a lot of damage directly to the HQ. So that begins to become a little scary having those units in some ways, although of course you still need to use them. And then with the 
German Italy control. This list looks like it's particularly looking to deal with air particularly well, with things like the Careless Talk, while also being a good card against Jagro as well. Um, and the Merry Nostrums, if you're able to survive just into the mid game, not really even the late game, then you're able to start healing back up again with a Merry Nostrum on a high value target like a Panther G, uh, which really gives a lot of options to beat um, Ying's decks here from J King's lineup. And let's keep in mind, this is a best of three with one ban. I will not ask the question that I know our experts absolutely hate, and that is predicting the bans, but we do have them. So let's go ahead and bring up the screen and take a look at what has been banned here in this first quarterfinal matchup between J King and Ying. So it looks like uh, Ying is going to lose the uh, Jagro list. I think to uh, Berto, your point, maybe that's around, you know, Jagro can kind of just win all the time um but jaking is losing the uh is that the soviet otk deck that's getting banned it is, yeah and i'm sad about it what's the logic behind that i feel like an otk deck while it can pull off a big victory it's it's very draw dependent it's very matchup dependent and can be a challenge to pull off well yeah. Ian does have two decks that are really vulnerable to scorched earth um, which I think is a big reason why you might ban this OTK list. And the other reason is that you don't really see it, and you might not know how to play against it. You might be a little scared to uh, make some mistakes into it in your first ever OCC appearance, um, and you'd rather stick to traditional matchups. That's fair. Spooz, did you have something to add there? No, no, it, it makes absolutely sense. Like the Scorched Earths are just so, so crucial against um, Ying's lineup here. If if you just have three, four units on board, get hit by a Scorched Earth. It slows you down so much and then you're very, very vulnerable to the OTK that might come there. So it makes absolutely sense. But yeah, now um, Ying has to face that German Italy control deck, which is, yeah, maybe even... Um, as bad as the to play against that Soviet OTK deck. And what's your take on on J King banning the um, Jagro list? Typically, we've seen you know Bubbles has put his advice out there: always ban Brit. Uh, arguably, the Brit deck is a little bit more versatile, possibly a little bit better than the Jagro list. What are your thoughts on banning Jagro here? Well, you already are bringing um, this German Italy control deck that's a little bit teched more to beat air so i think that might be one of the reasons and your own jagro is also decent into air so even though air is probably the strongest deck in the game uh j king's lineup is pretty good into it especially with the way ying ban banned i don't know if j king was suspecting this ban or not but um, it worked out pretty well in J King's favor. So uh, at least post bans, it looks like J King's uh, thought process made a lot of sense. You said J King wasn't maybe expecting that ban. What did J King potentially think might get blocked out of this first matchup? Um, that's a hard question. I think he's certainly aware that a lot of players, um, a lot of new players too, they aren't ready to. It, I don't want to be too presumptuous, but they might not be ready to adapt to something completely new, completely unexpected. Um, and so I think J. King was certainly aware of that possibility, and I'm sure it played a part in his thought process. But um, he might have simply thought that uh, his Jagro or his uh, Germany-Italy control deck might be banned. Probably German-Italy is... Uh, big contender. He's running two copies of Flam Panzer. It's very anti aggro tech. And uh, Ying is bringing three aggressive uh, decks to this tournament. So I think J King probably most suspected Germany, Italy to get banned here. So Spooz, essentially, you know, you've got the the control, obviously the German Italy control deck is a control deck. You've got the Soviet OTK, which has control components just trying to slow your opponent down so you can pull off your, your OTK kind of finisher. Is that kind of where 
that ban happened was, okay, well, the OTK deck also has stuff that I need to worry about slowing me down, like the Scorched Earth and things like that. Yeah, I, th I think it was not an, not an easy decision. I mean, both decks are really strong against Yings lineup here. And yeah, you have to fail a decision and then you probably pick the, the deck that you're less familiar to play against because yeah, we've just seen this German Italy deck a lot. And yeah, we're just going to see if the bands work out here for the players. Ying already with a good start here with the Gladiator, but Jaking even better with the Careless Talk. Lurking Danger, giving Jaking even more countermeasures now. Yeah, Ying, not with the greatest start here. Sure, he has had the Gladiator, but no Swordfish early on. And Jaking finding the Flump Hunter for the Sonya here. Really good start for Jaking. That's what you want to have. You want to remove the early threats on board so they're not really stacking in power here with the close air supports and naval supplies. Really good start. There are two sorcerers out of convoys. Ooh. Did they change the text on convoy? Draw two swordfish out of your deck or? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it looks that way. <laughs> um, and with the HMS Illustrious in hand as well from Ying, uh, you've got to <laughs> be thinking about, am I going to draw the Empire Strikes and am I drawing, going to draw it shortly? If so, that could be a big deal. Ooh, Kitty Ooh, Hawk. Perfectly was... taking out this Flame Panzer. Just on point here. Triggering from the deep. Shaking yeah. with several options here. You could go with the U88. Yeah, the JU88, very powerful into the Swordfish, but he does know about the surprise attack in hand which when ju is so high value in this matchup you might opt to try to hold it until the surprise attack comes out i wouldn't be surprised to see an admiral hipper here just to slow down ying yeah that would make sense on the other hand you just give your opponent a bomber brag that he can just maybe utilize later for empire strikes so really tough decision i like just going with with the other fighter in his hand, not sending the swordfish back, but fighters are blocking the attack on the HQ for bombers here, so the bomber has to attack the fighter first. And there are not a lot of ground units in Ying's deck, so it makes sense to just play it as a blocker here for the swordfish and keep yeah. the J JU88, as you mentioned, for later once the surprise attack is out. Yeah, a weaker play immediately, but uh, definitely the safer line. Sext might come in here from Ying. Pinning the FW. And that might be a little bit frustrating for J-King here, just because that's one of the few high-cost ground units that J-King is able to hit with the <laughs> Yagged Bomb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, finding the line for day, which cannot target the Saxon here. So back in but... the days when you could play Mount Ostrom on opponents' units as <laughs> well, you could play it on and it and give it four attack and then kill it with line for day. This is no longer possible, so we might see the hipper here just bouncing the Saxon, buying J King one more turn, where he hopefully can find an answer for that Saxon. Yeah, an Annihilation off the top would be huge. Leopold is a good card in the matchup, although is not going to be an answer right now immediately on this turn. J.U. In place, so what can do... What can Ying do here? He has one close air support, if I see correctly. He has the HMS. Ooh. Ooh. That's a little early to use the Empire Strikes here, it looks like. 
thinking about playing the naval supply run here. Yeah, naval supply run and close air support is really the only efficient way to deal with this JU. Um, of course, you're not getting the max value of close air support or naval supply run, but it still ends up being pretty good. The good thing about this one, that J King is now able to clear the board with the Lion 4 day and the V1 flying bomb out of the German research. Or you can just. Oh wow, you just found Sudden Strike, even better removal here. Absolutely. And now there's a 1 in 6 chance to. Oh, that was a very huge hit. Empire Strike's another good target there, but losing the HMS is huge there. Now only left with one swordfish in hand as a bomber here. So Ying needs to find the land lease soon. Otherwise, I don't see how he's really breaking through J King's removal fiesta here. And Ying pretending to hold up Ultra. I think maybe he's going a little <laughs> overboard with pretending. <laughs> uh, that might even be a giveaway in the other direction that it's not really ultra in Ying's hand. But it is something that Jaking has to think about. He can develop research before Marinostrum, or he might value research higher. Uh, and he is able to still trade out even if he lost the Marinostrum, so it wouldn't have been a huge loss. Not just trading that Spitfire out, also healing himself up for six. And he has the decisive defense activated. Did he just deactivate it again? Yeah, he might Is be he thinking. Also playing that... mind games now? <laughs> <laughs> he might be thinking um, that feigning a careless talk might have more value than um, holding this up because there's not a lot of ways for Ying to hit J King's HQ directly this turn. The HMS is already gone. He has a fighter up. Oh, he's yeah, I, I was thinking he was just HQ. thinking to go face because he has the decisive defense. That Monostrum unit, I think Ying has to take care of it. Otherwise, it's just healing for another six next turn. So that was actually a really good move here. Unfortunately for J King. Yeah, Ying, Ying has a couple of good options here. 594. He even could have played Swordfish, the Empire Strikes, and Air Superiority to clear board as well, and keep both uh, surprise attacks. The J King knows that Spitfire is not having Fury, it's not really a threat. Sure, it can just deal 6 damage, but I'm sitting here at 25, and I still have Leopold in hand just in case things are getting out of control. So he's just using the case yellow to discard one more card from Ying. Keeping him low on three cards now here. Decisive defense popping up. And then I think we might just see a big fat U-boat the next few turns here. Yeah. And these are Not... really the turns where Ying needs to see things like Lendlease and Convoy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's not really any good stuff left in his hand. A one and a two credit bomber and a su air superiority. Not really what you want to have. And there comes the advancement to the U-boat. So next turn, J King could remove any unit on board and make Ying discard two cards. Really good top decks here. Double air superiority. There was a Type 94 earlier that gave him the possibility or one more possibility to remove the JU there. Oh no, was it FW? Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm ready to say really good top deck against anything that isn't about <laughs> anything isn't that isn't a lend yeah. lease. Yeah. yeah. You're correct. I mean, one of the better top decks that isn't land lease, let's say like that. Yeah. So Sunstrike being played, Leopold deployed. Taking knows what in Jing's hand other than the top deck here. So that Leopold is really a problem for Ying now. Not really any removal. Both air superiority already air superiority is already played. None of these units have blitz. And double Mar Nostrum as well in J King's hand. 
Yeah, not I much mean, else to do other than play out all these units and hope you find just a little more damage off the top to be able to deal with this Leopold. Whoa! Rootout is okay, but it's a lot weaker post uh, playing of the Leopold. That's really tough. I mean, Monosham attack the Aichi and then go for a root out. Um, or do you advance into. And your Leopold still dies. I think it just makes sense to trade out into the Spitfire. I think Jaking might be thinking about hitting HQ again, but I think that <laughs> it's a little <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Let's see how crazy he really is. I'm waiting with bated breath here. Only 10 seconds on the clock to make a decision. Yeah, he's going the safer route here, taking out the Spitfire. And that shelling is also really helpful in finding answers. To that Leopold. Yeah, that's a decent draw. Yeah, and the, and the sad thing about being having an empty hand here that you both that J King could potentially play is not really good value at the moment. It can just take out one unit. That was a really good find here on the Heinkel. Giving him spoils of war to find more options because Jaking's hand is also not in the best shape here. Still better than Ying's hand for sure, <laughs> but yeah. he also needs to find more stuff to answer what is what might come here from Jing. I'm actually going for the root out, which is quite inefficient. But if Ying can't top deck anything, then it allows Jaking to keep his draw engine alive, which is huge. <laughs> it was the best attack of the match so far. Another root out <laughs> here for J King. And yeah, J King actually that ultra is kinda yeah, not really obvious, but there are not too many options that Ying would not have played here. Like any close air support I think would have been played to get rid of the Heinkel. So kinda obvious that that Ying might have the Ultra here. And I think J King is really aware of it. I think so. And yeah, he leads with the spoils of war. As Africa Core is very high value. That's yeah, a lend lease I, from I think Ying, he picked this especially for this, right? He just picked the 2k order just for just to trigger the ultra as cheap as possible. Yes. Wasn't it? Yeah, we all expect. We we did not see the other options, but I would expect it, him to. If it wasn't that. ultra, then you're happy to play it either way. Exactly. Ooh, and yeah. a king tiger. And Ying found the land lease finally. And the convoy on top. That's the first convoy we see, right? Yeah, Ying actually only runs three copies of convoy instead of four. Although this is definitely still unfortunate for him to find so few. Early on in this game. Double land lease. Triple convoy and you just find your first land lease and convoy when you have three attack. That's that's really not too lucky here. So do we see the U-boat? Ultra is out, so there's no risk that it's getting catched from anything. Also, yeah. not too many big threats on board here to target it. And not too many big threats left in Ying's deck. Um, the largest units are this Wellington and the RAF, the RAAF, um, I believe, left in this deck. And two pretty good hits. Yeah, um, two airplanes gone. Now only the Wellington left. Comet found, ooh. which is a really good answer against it. Wellington. And J King sitting at 30 health here. Things become 
more difficult here for Ying turn after turn. And I don't think Ying has the cards left in his deck at this point to deal with this. Yeah, no HMS left. I think one Empire Strikes might be left, but... No, um, because the other one got discarded earlier on. Oh, did it? Yes. That's even more unfortunate. Yeah, I, I think this Jaking can just control that match to the end until Ying is running out of cards. Only 10 cards left in Ying's hand. Uh, deck, not hand. Even though that Wellington is not really doing a lot here. Not in the combat now. Uh, from Ying's perspective, he, it's still a winnable position because he doesn't see this King Timer he doesn't see this Comet. But from our perspective, we can see that there's some of the hardest things to overcome in Jaking's hand. Nine hundred eighty-nine on top here. Killing the Sonya, knowing that there is a surprise attack in hand there, it's a really good idea to get rid of the Sonya. The other land lease, a little bit too late as we just realized. Yeah, not any good stuff left here. Elvacore, second Paracy is not doing a lot here. In just yeah. passing and yeah. HMS gone as well, which is one of the primary cards um, to find in this sort of position with the calves to have two units for the price of one. J King setting up the two turn lethal here and I think there's no way that King is killing him J King in two turns here. <laughs> no, certainly not, not having any guards in the deck, not having any discards. So I think this comet might just close out the game here in two turns. I think so. Annihilation as well found from J King here. And J King just choosing his other threat for good measure. Is it going to be a 989 in the front line or a Panther G in the back line? Not too important which way you go here. Yeah, that just gives him two two outs to win the game now even if 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 a miracle happens and that comet is disappearing out of his hand they're still at five five sing in the front line to close out the game and yeah that was really dominant and just showed how strong this german Italy deck can be against with air and giving j king the one zero lead here very very dominant appearance from j king in this first match and it, now j king only has jagro to get grew with and you never want to be <laughs> need to win two games in a row against Jagro, just because the high roll potential is so high um, and the aggression is so quick uh, you're never comfortable uh, winning two games against Jagro. although of course it is possible to do yeah i think it, it depends a lot what ying is finding and starting hand here if he's able to find a swordfish gladiator not uh, is it's really good, but not your optimal choice. I think Thorchus, Thorchus in some situations, much better than the Gladiator. But Gladiator is a good start to yeah just deal with the early Jagro stuff that is coming here. Yeah, Gladiator like, is usually better going second, but Swordfish is so much better when you're going first. Yeah, especially against all these one health tokens here, like the Bicycle Regiment coming down from J King. There comes the Gladiator. Bit of an awkward hand here for J King. Um, oh, Wind is really good on that matchup. But yes, we um, know that Ying has the air superiority. We might just see both of J King's unit disappearing here in turn two. I would certainly expect so. This turn Bree without a better draw is going to be really slow from Jacob. Arrival is really good. Gives him the draw on the feigned retreat. Signal regiment down. 
switching is also not having too many good answers to. Double, double surprise attack maybe, or the Kitty Hawk combined with an Empire Strikes later, something like that, but that Signal Regiment definitely going to deal a little bit of damage here over time. Panzer three H. So what does J King what what does he want to find out of the three H here? <laughs> Bombing raid. Uh, <laughs> not playing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know. Um, mm. But I, I always I always enjoy rubbing it in when it's a good bombing raid uh, turn with uh, J King's no bombing raid list. <laughs> um, of course, there are uh, lots of advantages to not running bombing raid as well. Um, but I'm sure even J King will admit that it's still a very powerful card. Um, it's just the consistency with these Arados that he's really looking to target. Yeah, Bombing Raid would be a really good value here, but he found the Wilberwind out of the 3H, which, yeah, in this situation is not really that great since there's a well established board on King's end. But later on, when the board is empty and the Wilberwind goes to the front line, it can be really annoying for Ying. As long as he's finding these air superiorities, he has answers to it. And Akita is also something that is not that great to attack into for Ying because of the two death damage, destruction damage from Akita. So I think so far we have an equal battle here. Yeah, pretty even. I I think hmm. I'm not sure who I'd prefer to be at this point in the game. Probably J King, just because Feigned is in hand and so powerful. Yeah, we might see Feint coming in here on turn six. J King probably just dumping his hand next turn. And, and the Ying mm -hmm. opting to deal two damage rather than get the Aichi on the board. Which is something I don't quite agree with. I think uh it would have been really, really nice to see this Aichi get down and be able to start dealing with threats from J King's side when he redevelops. Like we see right here. J King doing the trade. So usually as a necro player, you always want to go face when you have the possibility, right? But we know that J King wants to play the feint next turn. And I think he don't want to lose too much tempo here with that feint and want to be punished by close air support, for example. So this was a really good trade here into that 1-1, one, one, leaving that 35T on board. Yeah, and, and air I mean, is so... it revolves so much around buffing um, their units that I ooh. think... Uh, Ultra Conver here. Conborn. Oh. Well, but it's simply no way activated. It up. Yeah. yeah. It also would and... have been way too obvious, and J King would have never felt right if he would just activate it and he would have just gone face. So you cannot really play the Ultra here, even if you find it, and it would be really good. You can also not be 100% sure that J King has the Feint Retreat. So there's just too much risk to, to just lose to it when you waste three credits here and not trading it. And that signal regiment, look how much damage this already did. Yeah, J King Ins probably pretty Ins sad to lose Raiding Brigade. <laughs> but you gotta play Feigned. Yeah, I mean, Raiding Brigade, really good answer against a lot of stuff that is Ying having in deck. But yeah, you cannot play Raiding Brigade on an empty board here and skip on the Feigned regiment. You cannot do this. No. Yeah, and I... Ying has to speed up a little bit here, right? Yeah. Um... I think he's already played a little slow, and that's going to be an issue for him here. But uh, he can go as wide as he wants, because J King has used the Desperate Measures already. Yeah, there's no other mass removal in J King's deck. Desperate Measures being played, he's not running Bombing Raid in the deck. Finds the 15 Cavalry here. Aerodo really good in blocking those Bombers. Ooh, as is the key. J King, I imagine moving up um, to play around Monty. Let's 
Saxon found here. Yeah, I think he's forced to play Ming. the Saxon on the key, right? I mean, he can pin well, he can the key. Wellington and close air support um, to get a five attack bomber to trade into the key, which is also quite effective. Oh, he would have one more credit. He could just go Saxon surprise attack and kill the key, but run credit short. So there's an option to just pin the key. Going the Wellington route here. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. But this signal regiment is not going anywhere. Yeah, that's that's like you want to remove the big threats, but at some point you also need to remove the signal regiment with the faint retreat activated. That's just so much stuff that is running th towards Ying here, and that signal regiment might be the MVP of that one here. Jacking barely touched the HQ with units. Most of the damage just came from the signal regiment so far. Found another Type 94 here. Do you remove any of these bombers with the, with the double surprise attack combo? Um, it's an interesting choice. I feel like Sendai, just to be more credit efficient, makes a little more sense here. Um, you can move up this, yeah, this fighter to get another card down. Even using a, a surprise attack just to slow down Yang. And that's another three small units here that are not under smoke screen. That when they die, deliver damage from the signal regiment. A keter, another option to just deal damage to the HQ without even hitting it or, or attacking into it. Ying finally has the ability to kill a signal regiment, but he's not going for it. Instead, just expanding his board. Maybe just trying to face race here, hit the opponent's HQ. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the plan is just yet. Yeah, I mean, knowing that J-King is not running Blitzkrieg in attack and having two one-attack tanks in the back line, one-attack Aradu in the front line, sure, there are 35 Ts in the deck, but one of them was already played. So maybe you can just force Jake King to do some trades here next turn. Yeah. That Aradu not being in the support line any longer. So well, it's not protecting from the bombers. Both Warble wins are gone as well, which yeah. is also quite relevant. Ooh, Dino, another fighter for protection. Uh, maybe hoping for a Monty draw. Um, would Monty be... or Shelling would be good here. Yeah. yeah. And the downside of shelling is it actually uh, has the potential to clear J King's board and deal more damage to himself. <laughs> oh yeah, that's uh, true. <laughs> and maybe even make, give back a little bit of board space for J King to work with as well. And Sheedan is a pretty big draw. It's he's one credit short of the double attack with Sheedan next turn. Um, if he holds it in his hand, I mean, which I think he will. That is really a close one here. Ying needs to find Monty, I guess. Yes. Otherwise, that signal regiment will just be too much. That's a land lease. Another land lease. <laughs> we needed those last game. And you need to play it here or you're dead. You need to play it, you need to find Monty. There's you found Monty. it. Oh. And the naval supply run, which is a lot of damage. That could be enough damage for next turn. But probably not through this Sheedan. So, is J King having any options to kill his own units? No. So he cannot nope, rush but... anything into the front line. No, he cannot. But he has Ying... to rely on the Shidden, right? Ying probably has to kill this Dina here to apply enough pressure. 
which means the Shaden can trade out with this swordfish. It needs us one damage off. Or you can even go to the HQ and Ying has to deal with this Shiden. Yeah, just go HQ. Even if he kills the Shiden, yeah, exactly. you still would, you win with the, with the signal regiment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that board, look at this. We see a full board here now if he deploys another unit. All slots on the board are occupied. Yeah, pretty crazy to see. That's something you don't see there. And that Type 90 90 90 90 one, one turn too late. Too late. Yeah. Oh, he needed that earlier. But uh, Ying doesn't even have... Well... I suppose Ying can kill the Signal Regiment, but you need to trade one of your units to die in the ambush first. Uh... Ying can full clear this board and survive. He will die to the Panzer 45Ts after, however. Because I don't think he has enough credits to play everything he needs to sur to survive and to find lethal. I just oh, seems we really need a screenshot that. of that board here. That is a really cool <laughs> puzzle to solve. What is the optimal line here? How can Ying survive? So yes, you can trade into the Sheedan, you play either an Albacore or a Type 93, you double pin the uh, Signal Regiment, and you play the Empire Strikes to clear the board, and then you probably move double Aichi to the front line. Um, to, well, okay, you can't move double Aichi, so you can move an Aichi and a Swordfish up. But he only moves the Aichi up and J King is able to clear this out and find lethal. Wow, that was that was really cool. That was that Empire Strikes was really satisfying. But yeah, yes. J King managing to even win against Brit Air, and the first player being in the quarterfinals here today. No, in the semifinals even. We congrats. And I think that while. It definitely felt like J-King was probably in control for most of those matchups. I think it was still a pretty solid showing from Ying. I think that second game, Berto, you brought up maybe Ying playing a little bit slow with Britair, needing to put a little bit more pressure. Um, is that just to get away so that, you know, J-King doesn't just drop feigned and then smash your face? Yeah, you need enough pressure so that if your opponent plays feigned, you have enough damage on the board that you're able to kill your opponent before that inevitability really gets to you. Is that essentially the line since, like, you talked about Ultra during that game where if you're floating three credits on turn six, J-King's not, you know, it's not his first OCC. He's not <laughs> just going to drop Fane into it, but it's the question of, hey, if I don't, if I just play Fane this turn and nothing else, I'm going to take however much damage to face and that could potentially lose me the game. That's essentially what you're trying to do, the type of pressure you're trying to put on to prevent Fane on curved. On curved. Yeah. Man. If, uh... If Ying went for something like an HMS got uh, and a cast and got two two four um, bombers on the board instead of that convoy uh, right in the mid game, then he might have had enough pressure on the board that when J King played that feigned, it wasn't going to be enough. But you know, it's really hard to say in card games. Uh, so many things can go different ways. Um, I think Ying played quite well and a uh, really excellent play on that last turn to give him a chance in that game, even though it didn't end up working out for him. Yeah, you could definitely see that Ying was playing the right lines and saw what the opportunities were. It didn't quite work out, but you're also, you know, at the mercy of card draw sometimes, and you're also playing against the two-time defending world champion. So probably has something to, to do with it as well. Uh, let's bring up the bracket as we see J King moving on to the uh, semi-finals. I guess the bracket is still being finalized, so uh, we'll give that a quick second. But uh, just as a reminder, we're going to have uh, Tang Tang taking on Bezio as our second 
um, spotlight quarterfinal, if you will. And uh, right after that, we're going to have our first card reveal of the day. We're going to have four for you today. So uh, stay tuned for that. There's Jaykin going 2 0 over Ying. We got Noen versus Azzy still going on in the background. Tang Tang versus Bezio going to be our next matchup. We're going to show you here. And uh, Zi Young defeats Top Chef in Top Chef's first appearance here in an OCC as well. Speaking of Tang Tang and Bezio, we're going to be joined by Starry and by Bubbles here uh, to cast our next matchup. So uh, we're looking to get the players ready. We're looking to get into that. Welcome, folks. Starry, your first appearance here at an OCC Clash. How are you? Uh, how are you feeling? You're, you're on mute. On oh, screen. sorry. Sorry. Don't I worry about um, yeah, I'm feeling great. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Uh, yeah, don't don't worry about being on mute. I was <laughs> in hosting cards for two years, and I still do it. So uh, yeah, it happens to the best of us. So uh, we got Tang Tang versus Bezio coming up here. Let's bring up the player cards. We get to know exactly who we are going to see just a little bit better here. Um, let's go ahead and take a peek at who we're going to see. So there you have Tang Tang, no stranger to the OCC 82.2% win rate. So sneak it up right behind Jake in there, finishing second, only 320 matches. That is the picture of efficiency. Um, and we got Monty as the favorite card. Bubbles, what do we know about Tang Tang? I mean, Tang Tang is a long time player now. They've been around in the competitive scene for so long that I can't remember when they started. I, <laughs> I do remember when they first came onto the scene. I just don't remember how long ago that was. So it's been a while. Um, very, very top tier player. They're sort of one of the strongest players in cards. And, and you see that reflected here with their 82% win rate. And, you know, their favorite card, like you say, Monty, not going for any of that fluff, not picking any fun cards. Just this is a good card. This wins me games. I like it. Um, but yeah, Tang Tang is, I think a very well-known and household name at this point and is sort of one of the meta leaders. We've got multiple kinds of players. You've got very strong players who follow the meta and you've got very strong players that create the meta. And Tang Tang is certainly one of those players that creates the meta. I know when Tang Tang makes adjustments to their deck and when they do new things with the deck, instead of going, well, that's weird, people go, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to try that. And that's the sort of effect that these top tier players have on everyone else even other high-end players when you see tang tang make a move and make a decision you don't question it you follow it and you figure out why and how can you implement that into your own gameplay absolutely and we talked about the win rate 82.2 percent we talked about um j kings that i believe was 82.6 percent we went back into the archives and during the march clash der admiral had uh, a 83.62 percent win rate we believe that is the highest we've seen so far which is absolutely wacky um but let's uh, let's swing over and take a look at bezio bezio also no uh, stranger to the occ now has competed uh, a few times, in fact, Bezio has gone ahead and won the qualifiers three times in a row, finishing 32nd this season, um, kind of just, you know, paving their own way and deciding Psh, top six, that's that's too easy. I'm going to play some extra games. Um, and I'm going to get here the hard way. There we see uh, Bezio going ahead and uh, doing their favorite impression of uh, their favorite card that I uh, I would be hesitant to pronounce because I will probably get it wrong. Um, either of you two want to venture a, a try here? Yeah, sure. The card is called Buiskavitsa. Oh my lord. That, that sounded... I, easy, I don't know if that's accurate or if you just said something that's so convincing and me and Krista don't know better to call you out on it. I <laughs> it very... Yeah, I would absolutely not call you out on that ever. Uh, spot on. Well done. Uh, Bezio back here again, looking to uh, to go ahead and make their mark. Uh, Bezio currently sitting in fifth on the cards OCC leaderboard with eight points, so already in an okay spot. Looking again, gather some more points here today. Uh, let's go ahead and bring up the deck list and walk through the lineup we're going to see in this best of three with one Ben. We're going to start with uh, Bezio. Bubbles, why don't you uh, you jump in here and walk us through these three lists? So Bezio is showing us a little bit more of what the meta is, quote unquote, supposed to look like. These are the decks we're more used to. Not bringing Frontline, which is a very popular list, but you've seen quite a few people today 
not feel like bringing the front line. I think it's starting to get to the point with front line where people are trying to counter it and people are trying to tech their decks in ways that will combat front line just because it's such a potent deck. We still see Brit Air, very, very popular. Um, this deck is taking a couple hits soon, losing Empire Strikes, but I imagine we will see this deck stick about. So I don't think this deck is going anywhere. I imagine it will evolve, it will change, maybe we might see USA Ally. But here today we have the classic Brit Japan Ally. Um, it, it's really, really powerful. You've got these air superiorities, you've got these Aichis, which are really sticky. And we saw that game just then where... You know, Jake and Gon on feigned, uh, on curve feigned retreat. They got really, really powerful cards. They got lots of fighters to combat the Brit Air. And Brit Air was still like one or two turns off surviving. There was this huge, huge board, which most players would stare down and go, I can't defeat that. But actually, you know, with this lovely Albacore play to, to kill the, the Signal Regiment, they were able to completely destroy the board and nearly turn the game back into their favor. So it's just such a potent deck. You know, I talk a lot about whenever I see this deck, these Len Leases and these um, Convoys. These are sort of core part of what makes this deck so, so scary. This Raw Engine combined with this AoE like Empire Strikes. This deck is just sort of a bit of everything, you know, Tempo, Draw, AoE. It, it's just it's it this is the deck and i think we're gonna see that today um and i i'm hoping we're gonna see some abb some always banned brits if not we may see some people fear the wrath of brit air we then have this jagro deck now again jagro recently evolving to put in this panzer free h and try and find their cards a little bit better we do see i believe this is a two order feign retreat as well which is very similar to, to J King's list. I don't think there's too much to talk about here. We've seen this a lot. It's very aggressive. And one of the nice things about Jagro is it's a really a, a jack of all trades because it's trying to just do its own game plan. Unlike other decks, which are thinking, how can I counteract what my opponents are doing? How can I counter my opponent's game plan? Jagro is just trying to do its own game plan. And that way, it, that's why it can beat Brit Air. Even though it is a Brit Air favored matchup, you can just swarm them like we saw in the J King matchup. And it can be frontline. You can just go underneath them with, with these, you know, these beef wagons and all these one drops. And it can just burn out control decks. So it's just a jack of all trades. And this is one of the reasons players love this deck is you don't know what your opponent's going to play. Jagro is going to be a strong match into almost everything. And then we see Soviet France control. Now this deck rose in popularity a lot, especially to counteract things like frontline and really became very, very popular. But it's now started to go down a little bit, which might mean actually frontline can start to push its way back in. And we just see a little bit of a dance where this and frontline take in turns to have their time in the spotlight um but we do see you know phony war in this deck a really really good draw engine you've got court of the colonies this deck has longevity and so long as it can survive the early game using cards like scorched earth winter warfare and the brianks irregulars once you reach that mid to late game you just have so much longevity and so much counterplay to your opponents that this deck i mean it, it's a really valid ban and i wouldn't be surprised if this was the second option next to brits for what um is going to be banned here i would like to point out bubbles that uh, j king did not abide by abb and uh still managed to sneak it out so who knows maybe uh, as we get closer to that new expansion abb becomes uh, a distant memory of the past yeah but i i will i will never admit if i'm wrong about something <laughs> so I'll, I'll stick with it straight to the grave i can appreciate your commitment to that bubbles let's go ahead and take a look at what tang tang is bringing here today uh, starry can you take us through uh tang tang's lineup here absolutely so tang tang's first deck is our typical uh us germany frontline i mean this is one of the the most consistent decks in the format it's a really solid mid-range deck and it has a pretty good chance of sticking around post rotation so expect to see more of it even if it has changed somewhat um what makes this particular version of Frontline interesting is that uh, Tang Tang swaps out the either dive bombing or through the breach or even um, second copy of patrol for a tactical strike, which will be able to get rid of bigger units in the support line at the cost of, of course, speed. So I am excited to see how that works out. Next up, we have a typical Brit Japan Air. And we can see with Tang Tang's list recently, Brit Japan Air, I've seen a lot of players start transitioning towards a more long game plan. For example, using cards like Mosquito and Wrath Lightning, which didn't didn't see as much play 
in the past, uh, well, recent past, I should say. Um, but yeah, I am super excited to see how this, I would love to see a, a Brit Air mirror match because Bezio is going with a more low to the low to the ground, <laughs> uh, low to the air, <laughs> Brit Air match, uh, Brit Air deck, and Tang Tang is going for a more mid range, more value based Brit Air list. And then lastly, we have a Soviet US ramp list. And one of the things that I immediately notice about this deck is that it's only playing one copy of Spiring. Now, Spiring is obviously a super strong card that is that can function as a win con, as a win condition for decks, because being able to hit either U-Boat to discard your opponent's hand while getting rid of their best unit, or um, the the Brit uh, British research, the Royal research, but especially the U.S. research. The U.S. research acts partially as a win condition due to the 12 damage to the HQ from the Manhattan projects. So what this is telling me is that Tang Tang plans to win mostly with with other with other win conditions aside from firing because one firing is not going to be enough to guarantee a US research. So I'm expecting 270 second guards into IS um IS2 and B17 flying fortress as the best ways to take down your opponent including of course uh the draw from KV1 the two damage per per draw from KV1. So that is that's my expectation of how Tang Tang is looking to win with this deck. Right on. Let's uh, let's go ahead and bring up the bands and take a peek and see what decks these players are going to be able to bring along oh, with them. Oh, you love to see it. You love to see <laughs> it. It looks like my dreams of a mirror match are very, very far from coming true. <laughs> now, what is the exact opposite of that? So um, just no <laughs> Brit Air anywhere to be seen. Um, I will I will agree with you though, Starry. I was very curious to see how that would play out based on how different Tang Tang's list was. Um, obviously not gonna see it. So Tang Tang gonna have that front line as well as the Soviet US deck. Uh Bezio still gets to keep Jagro and Soviet France. Um, Bubbles, let's start with you. Any, you know, uh insights into who might be favored now that we've seen the bands and now that we've seen how things have lined up. I think it's probably Tang Tang, just because if you look at the Soviet lists, you know, Tang Tang's Soviet list is far heavier and, and far more better in the late game. So I think when you go into USA versus Jagro, it can almost be a bit 50-50. I think it can be slightly USA frontline favored if they were to get a Red Devils off or we can do it. It can be very aggressive and difficult for the J uh, Japan deck to combat back and take the front line. However, when we're looking at how these two Soviet decks match up, the B-17, the ramp, the late game, it all just makes it so much scarier for, for Bezio to have to deal with. And it looks like we're actually going to see this match up here. So Soviets versus Soviets, we have the heavier sort of Soviet USA. It is a little bit slower moving. But then the Soviet France, it's not out of it. You do have Petikov, you do have Defend in Depth, as we see in hand for Bezio. And it is certainly capable of winning this matchup. Yeah, and it looks like Tang Tang is going for a more late game hand, uh, a, not a lot of early aggression, which Tang Tang is essentially allowed to do because Bezio isn't looking to put down any early aggression. And so Tang Tang can be especially greedy with that opening hand. I think it's very interesting to see this uh, confusion because having this in hand for Tang Tang, it does give you a way of answering this Petlyakov. You can take this away from your opponent, and it's just a very good way of dealing with something which otherwise Soviets struggle to deal with. I mean, Air is generally one of the things Soviets struggle with. Your best removal pieces being things like Hammer. They're not good against air units, of course, not being able to target at them. So I'm very curious to see if this confusion is going to play a key role. <laughs> it looks like we're not going to have anything to do for the first couple turns for both players here. Nothing to play until turn three for Bezio, and nothing to play until turn three at the moment for Tang Tang as well. So it's off to the races with quite a slow start here. Yeah, unfortunately, um, Tang Tang's confusion, uh, although really effective against aggressive decks, is um, not going to be useful, uh, at, at least for a while. Because if you do take control of that Peliakov, it's just going to return control to Bezio pretty immediately. And in Bezio's case, that Scorched Earth is not going to be particularly effective early in the game. We see a, a nice Spiring draw. It allows Bezio to curve out nicely, Spiring into Advanced Research. 
So yeah, there are two Euro factories right in Tang Tang's deck, which is going to be something Tang Tang wants for this confusion. Like you say, without something to follow it up with, it sort of just fizzles out and you send it back to your opponent. So it'll be interesting to see if Tang Tang is able to find that. And still, I mean, Bezier at least having somewhere to put these credits now. But this is certainly the opposite of what we've seen in, say, this Jagra versus Brit Air matchup, where it's just, it's such a slow game now. And it, it just becomes less how can I be aggressive, how can I use tempo, and more how can I use my resources efficiently. I mean, seeing this US research, you've got to be quite scared from Tang Tang's perspective here when you see this US research come out, because this late game research that you can hit with these nukes or this penicillin, that's going to be quite scary for this matchup, no? Yeah, usually US research is, if not among the better researches to hit, it, it's often the best research to hit because it can also act as a win condition, advancing your game plan forward, as well as removing your opponent's game plan simultaneously. It's it's a very, very, very strong card. And here we go. Finding the hammer, again, not able to deal with the air units. The confusion, not going to be helpful yet. Tang Tang, just spending bloody sickle to do something and not spend too long waiting, but still not really finding anything to play. Now, if you're Bezio here, do you just start drawing cards? Do you start to uh, just apply some face pressure or do you just develop your research i feel like it's quite the opposite where tang tang has zero options and bezio has actually quite a few options i think that it, the, the the real decision that bezio is deciding between is whether to draw with call of the call of the colonies or advance the research when when tang tang has such a large hand like that you're expecting that there's going to be some kind of answers to the things that you're putting down so i would i would personally be tempted to play us research but honestly i think either either is a strong play i'm just gonna take that time no need to rush these things you know you do have oh i'm gonna go for the draw it looks like now call to the colonies does appear to have phased out of existence for just a moment but it's gonna go for the heel that is a very interesting play why could that be I'm going to be honest, I'm not quite sure, but it does give a little bit more of a buffer between uh, victory and death. <laughs> so I, The only theory I can think of, other than obviously playing around Phony War, which is still somewhere buried in the deck, is possibly thinking, if I'm going to develop nukes, I might not have the hand space to drop these nukes, actually. So Bezio may be thinking sort of, six or seven turns ahead down the line saying well i'm gonna need hand space for these nukes so i'm gonna just heal now but still like you say it's it's a very sort of interesting play and it's certainly not something i would have led towards i would like to mention that playing that hellcat with four credits does mean that um tang tang does not have the opportunity to take out the Pelyakov. but tang tang was appear uh, was approaching max hand size and I believe that instead of confusion, which would essentially do absolutely nothing at all, that at least the Hellcat will force Bezio to spend those two credits and potentially hinder his game plan a little bit, spending the two credits to attack the Hellcat with the Pelyakov. I'm kind of frightened of a potential mobilized Petlyakov. If you put down this Rima, obviously it can die to the hammer instantly. And I'm not convinced you should put it down this turn just because of credit efficient efficiency. But if Tang Tang isn't able to find a Ural Factories or Red Banner to combo with the confusion, you know, a mobilized Petlyakov could be really quite problematic for Tang Tang. And it looks like Bizio is highly considering going for that defend in depths while. The opportunity still exists, of course, Defend and Defs does uh, take your opponent's hand size into account. And I don't think the Tang Tang is going to have a small hand size anytime soon, but preventing those those one ones from coming down every turn was, was pretty helpful. Now Bezio, reaching that sort of mid to late point in the game where, you know, the, the payoff for this research is getting closer and closer. We tend to see people research around turn eight, and then on turn nine, you can instantly go straight to the nukes. So I imagine, you know, deploy some stuff this turn and then start developing this US research next turn, and you can still cover it out very, very nicely. Yeah, so it, it's it's almost certain that this, this oh, Rima no. is going to die, but... Fifth Rangers against Petliakov. 
these two options for fifth rangers are actually deployment effects. So when you deploy fifth rangers, you choose between zero operation cost and plus four plus four. When you deploy fifth rangers into a Petlyukov, you get a four four with four op cost. It, it is really not efficient here. And this Petlyukov is actually applying so much pressure onto Tang Tang right now. And Tang Tang is just having huge hand size problems. Just pushing up the first rifles in the full knowledge that it will die. The mobilize curves out so nicely, it dealt the two damage necessary, and now it's going to deal the three damage necessary, and when that second rifle comes down, it's going to do the four damage necessary, as it <laughs> doesn't look like Tang Tang has any way of dealing with it in this upcoming turn. And you can just US research and trade if you want here. I mean, right now, Tang Tang not finding any of their ramp pieces. They do find some of their late game pieces, but it's turned off by the Petlyuk of this B-17, this fifth rangers, not doing what you're going to need them to. So while Tang Tang's deck is heavier and can go late game better, generally on paper, Bezio just finding better resources and Tang Tang's resources just being shut down so, so beautifully here. The second fifth ranger draw is probably pretty frustrating if you're Tang Tang, but at least being able to play that 272nd does start applying some pressure. It creates an a, um, a threat that takes two, two removal pieces to answer two removal orders. Now, I wonder if we just see the nukes come out this turn. You can deploy the nukes, get them in hand, and you're actually looking to the point where you might better start pressuring lethal soon. It does overdraw for Vizio, but I it could be worth it, honestly. And you have to ask yourself as well, what do I need to do to get my hand low enough to not overdraw? And is that worth the delay on getting nukes? I think one of the nice comforts about getting the nukes right now is you know if a red banner comes out, you can answer these Stalins straight away. You can drop a nuke, you can hit one of them, and then you have the defend in depth next turn to finish off the last one. So it, it just... It gives you this certain comfort that actually they're not going to be a problem, but possibly waiting on it. Given that we know that Tang Tang doesn't have the red banner, uh, probably one of the better plays that Bezio can do is make the Going nukes and then and uh, and then destroy the two seventy second with one Manhattan project, and then follow it up with a defend in depths to take out the. ISU. Now we, we see Bezio being really conservative here, holding back the Yak, floating the 5k, and just saying, you know what, I'm comfortable with this Petlyakov on board. Got to deal with this as it is already, and I'm not really under any pressure to answer this board. Now, we do see with this confusion, you can deal with this Petlyakov as it stands right now for your next turn for Tang Tang. You go for the confusion on the Brinks Regulars, and then you can attack the Petlyakov and finishing it off, finish it off. So we may see Bezio needing to find some sort of solution to that, or applying pressure to the point where it's not really an option for Tang Tang. Uh, if you are one of the players, which which player do you think is in a better position right now? I think considering the nukes in hand, I think Bezio is in a better and stronger position, but I also think Bezio has more complications to play around, and I think there's more room for error. And these are very high skill players, but it's difficult to make perfect decisions when you don't have perfect information like we do. We have the luxury of seeing both these players' hands, we know what there is and what they have to play around. And I think there's just so much more room to accidentally chuck the game back into Tang Tang's hand. So I think if Bezio can play this perfectly, then it's Bezio's game. But the question is, are you going to play, be able to play around resources that you're not even aware of? Yeah, when your opponent has such a full hand like that, the amount of things that you have to consider, the amount of things going through your head um, is enormous. Especially with these... Oh, the Ural! The overdraw uh, on the Ural factories! That is a disappointing overdraw. Oh, God. That's going to feel really bad if you're Tang Tang. You are still able to go to, for the Confusion play to trade away into this Petlyakov. And Bezio may need to try and start doing something with these nukes too. I mean, you can go Manhattan Project. That's a total of 12 damage, I believe, to face. Alongside the Winter Offensive and the KV, you could potentially just burn Tang Tang out just through these nukes and KVs and Winter Offensive. It's a lot of damage. And being at 37 HQ defense like that, 
means that you have a lot of room to play around to try and advance your win con with those nukes, with the winter offensive. So if you're Bezio, uh, you have time. You have time to advance uh, to advance your research or or whatever other game plan that you have in mind. And I mean, still holding back on it, I would like to see it at least be developed soon so you have the option to play it when you need. I definitely agree. Uh, having the option makes your opponent really have to not overextend. And it's just nice. The, the pressure that it puts on your opponent, your opponent, whenever they, they drop a unit, they always have to consider, am I overextending into an inevitable board wipe? Or do I have to advance just to bait out the board wipes? There's you know, taking their time. No need to rush these things. And this is one of the things Bezio has in their favors. They have a lot more heal, which this heal can make this long game just far more sort of tolerable. You don't have to worry about being burnt out quite as much. Tang Tang having a few options. You probably don't want to deploy much more from hand because you do risk being blown out by AoE. What do you think the probability is that this game goes to fatigue? Knowing Soviet control, I think it's more likely than I'd like it to be. Um, I think <laughs> the, the next few turns are going to be really decisive in that. If Bezio can find, say, a Partisan's and Partisan's red banner, this guy in the front line, then I think Bezio is just going to rush down the game really quite quick. I mean, you could just go for, for nukes here and then... Yes, there's a Yosef Stalin on board, but you have lots of answers to it. You could even potentially just go for the double nukes. There's quite a few options here. Um, unfortunately, though, Tang Tang's hand only being seven cards, really, you're going to want there to be eight cards in Tang Tang's hand when you go for the nukes, because it allows you to go for the defend and depth follow up. I'm really curious to see which research Tang Tang finds off of Spiring, because um, just just what he finds could change the game quite a lot. Yeah, it could certainly have a very significant impact. Um, you know, finding the Brit research means you're, allowed, you're able to go for either a Sona or a Bletchley Park to force Bezio to, to act and take some actions. You know, if you find the Germany one, you can find this discard from Ubo. You can just find a lot of different ways of pressuring Bezio to hurry up and do something themselves. See Bezio deploying some units. Most likely trying to threaten the, the guy in the front line, the 272nd. Bezio, right. aside from being able to lay down massive damage with the Winter Offensive and the Manhattan Projects, is starting to run out of value. But because of that comfortable 45 uh, HQ defense, I don't think that Bezio is in any rush to, to really do anything. The I mean, if you can, is really helpful. If you can find this Partisans as well, it does give you just a little bit, bit more extra burn damage. You know, you can Partisans a B17 and hit face with it, and it just offers more of a, of a route. And we see actually trading with the Yak. I was sort of expecting a Chika trade, but trading with the Yak instead, deciding that they want the draw from their deck right now, finding a hammer, so they're going to have good answers for this board next turn, and they're not low enough on HP to tank, tank tank to apply any real board pressure. Finding another two fifth rangers. Duplicated. Ooh. Now that gives you some finishers right there. Finding the 272nd with the red banner in hand. Now I'd kind of like to see the board get dealt with first. You can go for the nuke. I don't know if you necessarily need to go for second nuke. I think one is sufficient. You go for the one, and then you can use cards like Hammer to finish off the board. Yeah, it would be it would be nice to see a 270 second guards come down. Only if the Yosef Stalin is able to continue to keep around, but with cards like B-17 and the combination of Sickle and Naval Brigade in Tank Tank's hand, I find it extremely unlikely, unlikely, especially with the board pressure, that if that 272nd guards drops, that it's not going to be pretty immediately answered. 
mean, there's also the worry that if you drop it and don't instantly play red banner on it, it could get partisan dueled or partisan uh, red bannered. You have seen one of them already, but there's still another two in the deck. And the double nukes coming out, dealing 12 damage to the face and killing both units on board. And it's starting to put Tang Tang in the danger zone where they're fairly low on HP. Going for the Spy Ring, finding the US research. So they are able to go for their own nukes, but that may be too slow. We may even see a penicillin come out just for the heal. It is possible. Does BZO have any uh, way to blitz out damage? The main source is going to be these Partisans. You do have the T60s, which can create the T34s, but I think this Partisans is going to be the main source of doing instant burst damage because you don't need to blitz it out. You just take your opponents. Now, I'm curious if we see some fifth ranger spam here. I don't know if you want to go all three because obviously that makes you very weak, but you could go for, yeah, go for a 4-4 four, four, and you can even go for the depth charges. That's really Worried. quite surprising. I imagine that's to play around a partisans. It's basically saying you cannot partisans my fifth rangers because I've depth charged already. If you're BZO, now, what are the decisions that you're thinking about? There's seven cards in Tang Tang's hand, and this would be on my mind, because you can go for the defend in depth plus the trade with the Chaika. That leaves you with plenty of credits, and you can deploy your KV and start trying to continue to apply burn pressure. It's worth noting that Vizio is using France secondary, and that KV1 er, uh, has the potential to combo with Phony War if Tang Tang ever drops their hand to a size which would permit that. Uh, and that can, especially when Tang Tang is at that low a health, Tang Tang is almost forced to keep a larger hand to play around play around that potential KV phony war. And I believe there is also... Sorry, no. I thought there may be the 5k ramp, the war bonds, which does give you another KV option as well, but not in Tang Tang's deck. I'm curious if we'll just see the Chika attack face. Yeah, with or that winner we... offensive in hand, it definitely does advance advance BTO towards a potential swift victory, but with two 8-8s staring you down, <laughs> that can be a difficult decision to make. <laughs> I'm going to say something here I don't think anyone's ever said before. It is only 16 damage a turn. <laughs> <laughs> you do have 45 health. You can take it for a little bit. You know, it's... you could also potentially go face and spawn in the double IS. Consider going for the defend in depth, maybe into the trade. Yeah. Just going to go for the hammer as well. Yeah, setting up a nice play with winter offensive that will both deal damage to the opponent as well as remove that 8-2 from the board. Now Tang Tang drawing lots of cards, finding lots and lots of options. Here is the Soviet Union, and there's quite a few cards you could be looking for. Finds the 270 seconds, so looking to apply extra pressure. Now, you can go for the Winter Offensive this turn. It does leave your opponent on, I believe, neutral HP because they take four and then they gain four from these units dying. But I do think this board is too threatening and you may need to do something about it um, as is. Yeah, it's just so juicy to to hit your opponent with a winner offensive here. I mean, those numbers line up just so perfectly. It's so satisfying. And you, you really need to get rid of this Engineers before your opponent can find a way to heal from it. Because if your opponent starts to heal from it, this potential KV Phony War Lethal is just out.